Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Black Archive Visual Podcast, episode four to be exact, which is made possible by the Harvard South African Fellowship Program run through the Center for African Studies at Harvard University. For exciting events and all things Africa at Harvard, I encourage you to visit our website at www.africa.harvard.edu. Detailed information on opportunities for fellowships, funding for undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as exciting research and public engagement listings can be accessed on our website. I am Sisigo Kumalo, your host, a visiting fellow of the Harvard South African Fellowship Program and a lecturer of philosophy at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa, where I teach on social and political philosophy, feminist and queer theory, decoloniality, and the black archive. Today, I am joined by the distinguished and incredibly talented Kanyisi Lembongwa, who is curator of the 25th Liverpool Biennale. She was previously the chief curator of the Stellenbosch Biennale in 2020. She's a Cape Town-based independent curator, award-winning artist, and sociologist. She works with public space, interdisciplinary, and performative practices, unpacking the socio-political, socio-economic, and socio-racial gender, queer, and historical contemporary complexities and nuances of the everyday. Kanye Silimbongwa is a multidisciplinary intellectual from Cape Town, South Africa. Her artistic and curatorial practices gained attention in the mid-2000s when she was part of the famous art collective, artist collective rather, known as Ku Collective. In 2018, Mbongwa completed a master's in interdisciplinary arts, public art, and public sphere at the Institute for Creative Arts at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. In 2019, she was appointed the chief curator and artistic director of the first Stellenbosch Triennale, currently showing in public spaces in the famous winelands of Stellenbosch in South Africa. Prior to this, she was the adjunct curator for performative practices at Norval Foundation, based in Cape Town. In 2018, she took up a curatorial research residency at CAT, that's the Community Art Team in Cologne in Germany, focusing on the public sphere, interventions, and public policies. As a result, she curated Blueprint, When There Is Nowhere To Go, Where Is Home? Currently, she works with the Norval Foundation as adjunct curator for performative practices um, and with Cape Town Carnival as curatorial and socio-critical development advisor. Can you say that's an incredible, um, that's an incredible CV. Um, I just wanted to start us off maybe with um, your creative practice, um, your curatorial practice specifically. Um, and one of the reasons why I am so excited to have you on this platform is because of the intersections between your work and mine. Um, of course, I'm more of the theoretical stuff. I basically <laughs> look at the amazing work that you guys do and sort of theorize that, but I'm curious about just a broad brushstroke of your creative practice, if you'd care to share that with us before we dive into the particularities of our conversation today. Okay, just want to rectify, I no longer work with Novel Foundation as the adjunct curator. Uh-huh, okay, thank um, you for that. <laughs> yes, I'm an independent curator, um, but that was an interesting project to work with. Um, hmm. Okay, so my practice as a curator is based on two pillars mm -hmm. that hold me accountable, mm -hmm. that set my intention, and that is Care and Cure, mm -hmm. founded on my ancestral connection with my ancestors and my ancestral practice, so that's the base and these two pillars stand as the things that hold mm. me in the work that I do, things that I go back to. Um, care in terms of, uh, in the institutions I'm invited to, um, whether they're charity, nonprofit, or commercial or museums, my, yeah, my attention is to the care ethics, like what kind of care ethics do these institutions have, not only as a language of care or performance of care, mm. but actually as a structural part of the system of how they run the institution so that the people that I get to invite, once I have accepted the invitation, are held within a space that cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me in my practice, I ask questions like, how do I care for the artist? How do I care for the person? Mm. 
mm -hmm. um, because we tend to um, treat artists as only producers of things and mm -hmm. forget that they are also human. Mm -hmm. And so needing to care on the human capacity, how do I care for the narratives that they come with? How yeah. do I care for the objects they make and the yeah. things they make? And for me, that's quite important. And how the institution that I've invited them to mm -hmm. is holding that caring space. And also, how do I care for the individuals in the institution? So really, care um, as a love ethic, as Bell Hooks would, would speak about, um, a love ethic. But also being very much aware that being in the practice of care means that you must be nimble mm. enough mm. to make mistakes. Mm. That caring in itself requires a constant, what I call, ancestral listening, mm. a forensic listening. Mm. You know, So you need to or at least in my practice, I, I surrender to, to listening as a practice that is something that I continuously learn Absolutely. Um, how to listen. Absolutely. Because for different people, my attention and how I put my ear onto their chest, onto the ground, onto their work mm -hmm. varies. Mm -hmm. um, and then cure. Mm. Um, how do I instigate spaces for a curing to happen? And so when I invite artists in, in those spaces, I need to ask and the cure is really on an institutional level so what are kind of the the policies of the institution around like how things can be hung in the space what are the the, the policies of the institutions in terms of like maybe even the systematic way of functioning um, what is the history of the institution how would that potentially be a place of harm for the people I'm inviting and so really working on an institutional level to to figure out how I need to create a space that allows the artist's work to come into the space mm. and do what the work needs to do mm. rather than having to negotiate the politics of the space, yes. the architecture of the space yes. and the history of the space. Yes. That's the work that I do beforehand yes. and so that requires me to again listen. Yes, listen attuned yes. to, to the space. Yeah. Now, can you say that the, another one of the reasons why I'm very excited for having you on this platform is because you and I worked together a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and you introduced into my vocabulary so a concept that comes up as part of this, of, 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 of these sort of two sides of the same coin, care and cure in your curatorial practice which is the concept of radical love. Um, and for folks who are interested, um, you know, you did a really, really cool interview with Nomsa Kubo um, in 2019, which was then published with the Journal of Decolonizing Disciplines that I was at the time editing. And I remember reading your, your contribution and thinking precisely about the profundity of these two concepts, right? Radical love and how that facilitates our reimagining of the world. Um, a lot of folks might not necessarily be aware of what this concept means for you. Um, and I'm interested in, in kind of expand or in, in exploring this concept yeah. a bit more with you in conversation because it's very different, for example, to read somebody on paper mm. versus to say to somebody, you know, you really have this incredibly emancipatory concept of radical love um, that is incredibly exciting. Um, what, what, how do we understand it? How do we relate to it? Um, how do you define it mm. um, in, in, in the work? And of course you do do this work with Unam Samakubo in conversation, right? They, there are aspects of, I would say, self-confrontation, right? Mm. Uh, a, a, a process of looking in, maybe, um, mm. that you invite us to that is incredibly exciting and liberating um, when, when you're detailing this concept of radical love. And I would just like you to share maybe a bit um, about that. I, I have to say first and foremost that radical self-love or radical black self-love does not mean that you don't love yourself. You know, it does not undermine the work that you've been doing mm. and how you've been existing in loving yourself. It does, though, put forward that there's another layer mm. into how we can love ourselves. And that layer is about, you know, figuring out the emancipatory practice that you can create from mm. the work you do, mm -hmm. or whatever the work may be. Mm. And so this, this, this thinking and concept becomes clearer to me as I'm part of the student movement, the hashtag Fees Must Fall, hashtag Roads Must Fall, being a fallist. And it becomes clear of what is being required of me 
by this time at the university, this request to having to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hold on. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. I should not die. Mm. And should not die because mm. black people have been dying. Mm. Mm. Have been dying. So why must this revolution, if it ought to happen, happen in my death and dying? And mm. so it begins there, this conversation, and really going like, wait, I come from the township. Mm. Where I come from, you know, people are dying every day in different mm. ways, socially dying, economically dying, spiritually dying, you know, literally dying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, socio-political, socio-economic, like dying, there's many deaths that happen that we witness in the township. I'm one of those witnesses yeah. and survivor and living. Yeah. And I was like, I did not come to university to die. Mm. This space, mm. you know, has been constructed for me to share knowledge, mm. be informed, be educated within the Western form of education. And so, the, the, the quest to decolonize it should not be at the expense of my life. Yes. I do not yes. need to burn for something else to be alive. Mm -hmm. Radical self-love. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But then what becomes interesting at that point is maybe two or three things. One, mm. everyone around me, you know, and the people that were at the forefront who were being more visible than anyone, you know, posing and putting themselves as martyrs of the movement mm. and quoting and sort of referencing like uh, Babu Steve Biko or Martin Luther, like, wait, but these people did not die, they were killed. Mm. There's a fundamental difference. Mm. And then what happened after their death? What significantly, sh significantly shifted in the system, mm. in the global system of blackness mm. that then was not anti-blackness? And I was like, we are still having the same conversations that were being had in the 60s, so mm. wait a moment. Mm. What does black death give us, actually? Mm. 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 I love that because it takes me, again, the, one of the things that I appreciated the most about that conversation was the reverence that you give to black life. So we constantly, and this will lead me to a second question, but one of the things that I... As a South African, as a black intellectual in South Africa, one of the things that I'm constantly confronted by is how we talk about blackness, right? Um, so for example, in the case of the literary imagination here in the mm. United States, um, you've got Toni Morrison's intervention um, where she does that essay, Playing in the Dark, right? And she's, she, she, she demonstrates the fungibility of black life in the United States. Um, you take that to the South African context. Um, J.M. Kutsia, 1988, White Writing and the Culture of Letters in South Africa, details from the 18th century and even the late 17th century, moving into the 18th century, how European voyeurs sort of portray black life. And what you do in that essay is that both yourself and Nomusa kind of do this radical break from that. Um, you know, on the one hand, one finds this depiction of the pain, the suffering, the all of it, but in between all of that, you show us that there's actually life here, yes. right? There's, there's, there's life, there's livability, and that means that we need to pay in the township, in the location, we need to pay attention mm. to the livability, right? Um, and I wonder if I can invite you to kind of, because that's a very radical position, because you know, having trained in the ways that we've trained, the schools that we attend in South Africa, they kind of inculcate within us this sense of self-abjection, right? This, these abjecting moves of the self where mm -hmm. you're like, even as a black person, I will take a particularly curious outlook um, in terms of how I refer to, write about, think about, theorize, talk to, talk about blackness. And it was, as I say, that, that I think you folks did that piece in 2018 and it was published in 2019. And for the first time, I'm confronted by, as I'm editing this work, I'm confronted by the fact that there, there's a politics, there's an ethics of care in how we're talking about ourselves. Um, and I'm curious about what it is that informed that sense of 
if one can conceptualize it as a rebelling to say, I'm not going to buy into the ways of supposedly summoning black death, even in the ways that we speak. Mm -hmm. And that's a very radical move, right? Again, thinking about, which will lead me to the next question, thinking about how we've encountered ourselves as a result of how whiteness has curated us. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just curious about <laughs> what, what, it, what it was that, that, that gives you the sense of, I don't, want to, I don't want to participate in that, and how you begin to kind of detach yourself from that. Because being embedded in those kinds of systems, it's very difficult sometimes to be like, I don't want to be a part of mm. this way of representing, writing about, thinking about who we are as a people. Many things, mm. right? Many things. Um, the Kulele Kugleto, mm. mm, you know, I grew, grew up in the township, but also in Makaya and Natal and Soze, mm. you know, my Ingaba, Ingaba Yami Sensoze, you know, that's mm. where my family is from, in Natal, or bulk of my family, then you're from Swaziland, then you're from, you know, West Africa, mm -hmm. there's many other places, but um, in the immediacy of, like, when I say, Aban Base Kaya, Gipege And so, and so one, um, I did my, my honors, right, in curating, and, and I focus on this idea of like um, authentic ta township blackness, which is ridiculous because we didn't come up with that as part of the, you know, township tours. And I focus on like this idea of, you know, how blackness is performed and how we need to perform blackness. So this is one of the first times I'm starting to realize in which the ways in which our lives and the township as a space continues to be a white project even post-94. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, continues mm -hmm. to be a white project where our bodies can only exist in this performative state, you know, mm -hmm. in a perpetual performance. And mm -hmm. this is why also this, I don't reject it, but my interest then became like, what are the other ways in which I can read blackness? Mm -hmm. Because performance and performance theory does not know how to read mm -hmm. the work that mm -hmm. we do. It mm -hmm. ritualizes it. Mm -hmm. But I think the fundamental moment when um, I started thinking about blackness, um, as something that is alive, that is happening, that um, is otherwise, is when I went to Stellenbosch University, when I made that decision mm. to go back to university at the age of like 25, 26, mm -hmm. and to live, like leave everything behind, I had a good job, nice job, <laughs> left everything. <laughs> yeah. And and I remember, I remember very clearly standing mm. Ekaya, Ekugletu at the gate, and my house is a corner house next to an alleyway, and thinking, and I'd had a conversation with one of the guys, you know, who are my friends, is Kula Songe, about desire, about accumulation of wealth, about dreaming. Mm. And how does one do that in the state of duress or the state of emergency that is township? Mm. And so I'm standing there and I'm looking at, you know, the electric box, which we call Udenja, mm. and kids are sitting there, these boys are sitting there. I'm looking at Ispaza shop, mm. you know, guys are gathered. I'm looking at Ikhanga, at the entrance of the, the Ikhanga, which is mm. the township alleyway, and kids are gathered there, and I'm like, these are all spaces that we have come to define and learn in, in some weird form that they are dangerous and violent, and therefore the people standing in, in and of these places are that. I was that kid. Mm. Mm. I was that kid who stood there, mm. and I know that place would be something else. So that was one. Two, being curious about like, when did I learn to be afraid of blackness and black people and black men? Mm. And what type of black men am I afraid of when I'm walking down the street? Mm. And then the, the, the question to the question was, but why am I not afraid of white people? Why do I feel safer in white environments when white people oh, continue to loot, have colonized, and, and have convinced me mm. Mm. that this toxic violence is okay? Mm. So this was the question. This, of course, was a dilemma. And I was like, I don't even know how to speak about this. And, mm. I, and then I was like, okay. So I need to go back to university and find the language mm -hmm. to mm. write about blackness <clears throat> in other ways that I know of blackness. But also being curious of like, unpacking and unraveling and you know mm. going within like why mm. what is the township what has the township made me mm. how has the township made me but also the idea and the concept of the township what is this place actually mm. dp mm. 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 um and i was like the best place to go to in south africa is actually stellenbosch mm -hmm. university mm -hmm. the center the epicenter 
of apartheid mm -hmm. as a theory, mm -hmm. as a logic, a place where people spend time. As academic discourse. Yes, mm -hmm. thinking and theorizing mm -hmm. and testing, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But also to go to a place that will violently displace me mm -hmm. in order to send me to the depth of my own blackness mm -hmm. and to figure out whether I will be able to swim ashore. Mm -hmm. So, so these are the steps that the kind steps, of... But also, these, at that moment, I was already being radical without knowing yeah. it. This, this yeah. moment of like yeah. making these decisions of like, yes. Yes. in the yes. mix of it. But yeah, I speak fluent Afrikaans. I read Afrikaans because I went to an African school. Yeah. Right? So I have the language in my tongue. So, um, yeah, so these are the first moments. Um, mm. I'm writing my master's. My master's was t is titled. Um, Echanga, mm. like I'm really looking at Echanga, um, Echanga mm. as a, a, a public space for black radical imagination. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I have sat and thought through the space, just this liminal space, mm. the space without spaciousness, right? Mm. Because it is a space without spaciousness because the township has no space to be spacious, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so thinking through like, and how Echanga is reproduced in our transportation systems, you know, mm -hmm. how we hang as part of the daily migration between the township and the city, the township and, you know, as Lalin. Mm -hmm. But also learning that but the township is not really urban, nor is it rural. Mm -hmm. It's this in between. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of blackness does this place produce? produce. For sure. I think the, 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 there's a lot that you've said that, that I want to kind of speak to, but I think the one part for me that, stands out the most is the question of how do I learn to fear certain black bodies and to that trust was, uh... um, others. Um, <sighs> and, 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 I, and I had a similar kind of experience. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why, for example, I, I find it very, very curious that white liberal South Africa will say to us and to our children, let's teach Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country. That is by far the best book that we have produced in the country. And yet, when you read that book, can you say that that book is a book that inspires some of the insidious forms of black hate, self-hate amongst ourselves? And, mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you how I come to realize this. I, I, I read the book in its English um, original, and I'm like, e oh my God, like, there's, there's something, something that's just that's just not sitting well with me in this text, right? Um, in fact, so I read the thing, finish it. And then somewhere, somehow, at, I was doing my master's at Pretoria. Again, we go to these African institutions. <laughs> hey, yeah. So we go to these African institutions and I go to Pretoria, I'm reading my master's. I meet an incredible, um, Sociolinguist of his Zulu, African languages. And Umpume says to me, I was saying, You know, there are titles that have been translated into his Zulu. Listen to him now. You know, there's this one. Um, what is it? There's uh, Cry the Beloved Country translated into his Zulu. As La Felchega Kulu by Osmosis on Yembez. So the book comes out, I believe it was in 48, Cry the Beloved Country. Besse Kuzotim of 57, Unyembezi Azoti La Felchega Kulu. And I'm like, you know what, Gatting, I couldn't find Zulu. I'll be in touch with what in fact, Gitang, not even what Gitang, and read this book and, 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 and read it in my mother tongue. It's December. The book is still disheveled to this day because I flung it across the room because I saw reading it in my mother tongue, reading it in his mm. that what what was discomforting about the book when I was reading it in English. English. Right? So here's the character of Ukumalo's son, mm. right? Kumalo Shaleko boy is a priest and all of these other things. You see Ukumalo, and Mina and Kulilim Zimkulu, right? Mm. Kulilim Zimkulu, for the better part of it, moved to Maritzburg, then go back to Mzimkulu. Once my parents are like, Anseke Kaya, you know, what's the point of us being in Maritzburg anymore? So 
this geography that Peyton is describing, that Unyembezi is writing in his Zulu, is a geography in Gyazi. It's a geography that I've seen, that I have traveled, that I have looked at, that I am familiar with. Um, but on the other hand, I have a different way of applying myself to this mm. geography than a white eye does, a white liberal eye in South Africa for that matter. Um, Ahambe Ukumalo, he's now coming up to Joburg and you see, you know, he's passing through all of these spaces. He gets into this Johannesburg spot. And the reason why I flung that book across the room was when I was looking at Ukumalo's son, the character, mm. the main character who's the source of the problem in this text. Sikula, ngikula, ngati sikula, ngikula, gangil zondi ikoli. In black life, as part of the black community, we adopt the notion of equality that we find in Alan Payton. Right? Umfano mm. can is unrecognizable because they become this Kumalo's son mm. kind of thing. And I think to myself, if as a kid, grade 10, grade 11, you know, standard 8, standard 9, I'm reading this thing, and this is the thing that's told that I'm told I should live up to this thing whereby the black man, black masculinity as I'm reading it off the page, is repulsive to me. Of course. As a black man. Right? Which means what? Which means Guti, I will hate myself, I will hate my mother, I will hate, hate my sister, black. I will I will hate my I will hate Go myself. Go right? Mm -hmm. Um and this is what the problem is with Peyton's Cry the Beloved Country. And then you have his other short stories, a game, right? Nakona foot nazo and these are things mm -hmm. that we were made to suffer through, by the way, in mm -hmm. our education, yes. in our pretty in our prestigious Prestige. model mm -hmm. C schools, former mm -hmm. model C schools. Um, there's this one particular short story where there's this old man, it's a Friday evening, uh, this man has his wages, he's going home, he's passing through um, what is seeming like an abandoned metal scrap yard kind of thing, as he's passing through, his own son takes his wages with a group of friends. And again, what do you see there? This is the story of Johannesburg, by the way. Mm. He's writing about Joburg. Peyton is writing about Johannesburg. What do you see there? You see this thing that's literally repulsive. How can I, for example, turn on my own father, Gimtatili Mali, Azogazuti, Asniugulangayekaya, Right? So when I see that, again, I'm like, that's not me. I don't want to be that. And so I become something else. And I think that that's the fundamental problem with white liberalism in South Africa is that it styles itself as... As the savior. Absolutely. As the savior. Progressive, aligned with black struggle, aligned with black thought. And yet, if we look at Uhornley's work, you know, there's a paper by Robert Bernasconi that came out, I think it was in 20, I think it was 2013 or 2018, and he looks at the figure of um, Hornley in South Africa. Hornley, who's in conversation with Old Uma, for mm. example. Mm. Old Uma publicly says of Hornley, we do not want white liberalism in South Africa. And this is as far back as the 20th century. Mm. We don't want white liberalism in South Africa because you people are paternalistic and you do not see us as being able to govern ourselves so, and to direct our own freedom and to direct our own ambition. With that having been said, I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> that's a mouthful. <laughs> I want to follow up with a question of, you started out by saying that your curative practice is informed by care and cure. And I'm curious about how you've encountered the artscape in the South African context. Mm. Um, that motivates you, that mm. draws you to, but we need to care, but we need to cure mm. as we are managing, as we are handling black artists and blackness, black mm. artists as beings, black artists as artists, black artists as creatives. Mm. I mean, I, I wanna go back a little bit mm. and then I'll go into that question because I think there's something I mean, it's a very difficult thing for me to sometimes relay, but it's something important that informs how maybe even from a very young age, I began this journey of like 
what does it mean to be black in the world mm -hmm. um, when I'm looking at it through my own eyes. Um, when I was in primary school, so um, I was like most people, one of the first people who went to public um, white people schools mm. um, post 94. So mm. I start my kindergarten and so I would go through a, um, an African's way of being introduced to language and education. So technically my first language is Afrikaans because that's what I learned mm. how to write in, mm. right? The f mm. Me writing, I'm writing in Afrikaans because I speak Afrikaans, I speak Afrikaans. And then maybe grade yeah, four, like in primary, I'm then shifted into an English school. Mm. So I cannot speak English. Mm. You know, English is a subject that I do in school. So I'm, I go into this English school. I'm raised by my Zulu grandmother. So it's because I'm going to be a school. I'm going to be a school. I'm going to be So there lies in two things. Mm -hmm. I'm in a, in a city in Cape Town that is predominantly closer mm -hmm. and in an environment now that speaks predominantly English mm -hmm. when we are black, colored, and white. Mm -hmm. Here I am not being able to articulate myself in either mm. languages. Mm. Mm. And so already, mm. like I learn at mm. a very young age, the violence of language, mm. very young age, mm. the violence of language, mm. because I cannot even begin to describe to you what I mm. went through in primary school. Mm. I become friends with the odd kids in primary school, mm. close friends with Sarah and Angela, who are sisters, and we do sleepovers because white people do sleepovers. Mm. My grandmother's like, don't go into the pool because your head. I didn't understand that. For me, we are all kids. Mm. There's one particular dinner that I will never forget. Mm. We're sitting on the table. We are kids. We are having fun. Angela's mom turns over and looks at me and says, you know, Delisha, God made a mistake by making you and your grandmother black. First time I'm, I'm learning that I'm black, by the way. Mm. Because I was just mm. a child up until that mm. point. You know, mm. like we're all kids, like I'm, I'm black. Mm. And it's a bad thing. Like mm. God made a, a mistake. mistake. Mm. Mm. Then suddenly mm. I'm mm. a child. And I need to stress this. Mm. Naive, childlike, innocent, not knowing. Mm living in a world of my own imagination, a mm. child. Mm. Mm. First moment I'm in primary school, I am told by a white person I'm black and it is a bad thing amongst other kids. I start to realize, but oh, actually my hair looks different from everyone else and my grandmother always tells me not to go into the water without wearing a plastic bag. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah's mother never, 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 never combs my hair, but combs everyone. Like, oh yes, actually my skin, to like just this, Weird realization and realizing, oh, this is why my grandmother takes me on the train and then asks me to write about what do I see mm. from the township into Camps Bay, from the township into Calc Bay. Mm. What do I see? What do I see? What do you not see? What do you imagine? What mm. you... And I'm like, because I'm black. Mm. And being black is a bad thing. First encounter mm. of how blackness is perceived in the world. That informs, I am sure, how I have become in my life to want to land into my blackness softly. Mm. Because the initial introduction was yes, violent. Very violent. In a world that was telling me we are anti black, mm. right? Mm. And so that for me is one of the, the important moments. Mm. The second important moment in academia, and one probably that informs me calling myself you know, identifying as a reluctant academic. Mm. I'm in Stellenbosch, I think it's my first or second year. Um, I'm majoring in English, it's mm -hmm. one of my majors, literature, because I think literature is always way far ahead in terms of thinking mm -hmm. about many things. We are tasked to read Boyhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's not, I think it's Shem Kutsia. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I can't remember the author, but mm -hmm. Boyhood, that book, mm -hmm. That book haunts me to this day mm. about how mm. it speaks about blackness and black boys mm. and how it positions mm. whiteness and white Afrikaner as the victim mm. in apartheid. Mm. And then I was further tasked by my lecturer mm. to be the one 
to write a summary and the response to this text to this text and and and, and I, i'm so sorry to interject here but i think this is one of the reasons why for example i mahmoud mamdani has recently come out with that book of his neither settler nor native right it came out uh, in 2021 mm -hmm. and he takes a, a, a number of cases mm. but the one thing that I found fundamentally objectionable in that text is that he says for example that the incredible South African miracle is that we all post apartheid come to the negotiation tables as victims right all of us and I'm like Jani Jani, right? And part of it is, is the fact that for the longest time, and again, it, it, there's a curious problem here. There's a very, very curious problem because, for example, Afrikaner nationalism kind of hates white liberalism. Um, and white liberalism hates Afrikaner nationalism, but they are in collusion and they love each other when it comes, comes to, to hating blackness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Black people. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's there's, a, there's a, a setting aside of our differences when it comes to managing these people who, who, who are, and this is one of the reasons why I ask, Uba, how can we all come to the negotiation table post-1994 the post-apartheid moment as racial victims so song Njani because there were people who were actively investing, by the way, in ensuring in Dobana. Our mothers, our fathers were in the mines. Our mm -hmm. mothers were taken away from us because they were live in help mm -hmm. in suburban white communities. Mm. Mm. But you're assuming that we are all human. This is this is. Eh, but what I'm saying, that's what you're assuming. So yeah. when he's saying all of us came onto the table as, as victims, victim. it is not black people. Black people are not in in the table as victims. Mm. Mm. This is you know this is the the the, the critical ones. It's like what you, what is being communicated. Like we all came as victims, but you know not all men are equal. George, oh yes, all men are equal, but some are more equal than others. Right. So the victims that get to sit on the table mm. is not you and I, is not our mothers, is not our fathers. This is true. And this is the reason why then I, I and, and, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question of how have you encountered the oddscape? Because, for example, as a philosopher, the one thing that I'm constantly challenged by in South Africa is the question of why are we being denied the opportunity of theorizing ourselves? Because we then have the Mahmoud Mamdanis who invent a story continuing the invention of Africa of we all came to the table as racial victims. Like, John, but this is, this is also my experience. The reason hmm. like I am in the arts, I guess the reason the work in my arts isn't that like finding the language to speak about, about what we do. Mm. After realizing that the language that I'm learning mm. in art school, I mean, I dropped out of like, you know, mm. art history at Stellenbosch. I was like, Ngeg a shame. <laughs> I was like, nope. No, 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 no. You cannot tell me that in the 1960s, there were no black photographers mm. who were like inventive. That you want me to believe that? I was like, no. Mm. Uh -uh. Mm. You know? Um, yeah, like the need to to theorize, mm. you know, this is why I went back to varsity, the need to theorize, and I didn't study art, you mm. know, like I studied sociology. Mm -hmm. The need to theorize ourselves into existence mm. and that theorizing mm. not being stuck in, in the tower, but through our lived experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, um, my curatorial practice sits within the care and cure because I'm like, in this theorizing, I do not want to reproduce the violence. Mm. This mm. is very important to me. Mm. I do mm. not want to reproduce the violence in how I curate. Mm -hmm. In my, imag I curate because I'm imagining a world yes. or I cannot bear the thought of not being able to imagine the world, yes. which I'm always denied, you know, mm. denied in very simple things. We grew up, all of us, 
being fed this narrative, um, hungry children cannot imagine. We survived on imagination. Mm. I survived on imagination as, mm. you know, coming from the township. So what is this invention that like, mm. you know, we can't imagine? The only reason, one of the fundamental reasons we are here is because our, of our radical imagination. Mm. And I have st countless stories, my own, my friends, of how we would take magazines and imagine ourselves in like hungry to mm. the core. Mm. And yet still have the capacity. And it is the imagination of... that holds, mm. that's, that holds mm. Mm. the mm. hunger together mm. like this, but like it, the hunger will not break. Mm. You know, so this lie, the weight of the lie, there's so many like, and this is the other thing that in my work I realized, like we carry so much of the weight of the lie. And the lie is that the only thing that can happen to black bodies, the only way in which black bodies can exist is through violence and the index of pain and suffering. This is the only way. You can only read your blackness through being conquered, mm -hmm. through, like, this is mm -hmm. the only way, being violated repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but if that is true, why are we still here? Mm -hmm. If your project was to ensure that we have no capacity to breathe, mm -hmm. Mm. And so for me, this is where it, I become like, wait, actually, we're here. And, and, and th th there are things that don't, that don't, don't add, add up. up. Yes. And this is why I, I, you know, I, I go back to this question of how... I, I read art history. I didn't drop out. I dropped out of philosophy and then I came back to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I dropped out of. Um, but I, I, I read art history um, and... Partly, I think one of the, the reasons why I stuck it out with art history was because my teachers were black. Mm. Pindezwa Miaga, for example, who's now at UWC, Sam M. Luli, the director mm. of the Standard Bank Art Gallery, um, Charlene Khan, Zaman Zele, who's now at UC Berkeley. These were my teachers at Rhodes University of Art. I, I really you was. You were lucky. <laughs> I, I really, really was. You and, were lucky. And all of them are uh, all of these black women, I don't think I actually ever was taught by a black man in art history at Rose University, which might have been to my benefit. But anyway, all of them are seriously thinking about black art practice, mm. right? Um, which is one of the reasons why I then say to myself, okay, let me head back to philosophy with this knowledge that I'm mm. carrying, because now, when I'm told about the work, for example, of Heidegger, of Wittgenstein, mm. of Hegel, I will be able to say, okay, cool. They've done that work. Immanuel Kant's, uh, oh, what, what is it, uh, critique of, 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 of judgment. All of this work happens and, I'm, and then I can say, okay, cool. From the perspective, for example, of the critique of judgment, we have a different vocabulary when it comes to the aesthetic, when I'm looking at Utumile Feni, for example, mm. when I'm looking at George Pemba, when I'm looking at Penisiopus. Mm. I, 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 well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But like, but you, you get, you, you, you're getting me. You, yeah. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a different register of an aesthetic, for example, that I'll get from the black, artistic tradition in South Africa. Um, and, and I then find it necessary to then challenge the conception, Yoba, Gagade, we don't have an aesthetic register. And I'm like, but we do. do. Of course we do. But we do. It's just that our registers are illegible. I misread. Because, you, because they don't want to read them. Because they don't know how. That's what not I mean. that they don't want, they don't know how, and when they don't know how, they say it is not there. It does not exist. Or they invent. And so for me, it's like a similar thing, like being very curious about, you know, what happens in public spaces, mm. like public interventions, like what are these sculptures? What are these statues? What do they mean to the black psyche? Like when you have to pass like a statue of any sort of white person, white man, being like what does it do on a daily to you in mm. our psyche, right? Mm. And how do art interventions and not like permanent work in these monuments intervene? How do black people who make art, mm. how do we read that work? Because for the longest time, I mean, especially if you're talking about art history, like what I found is that 
what the person writing about um, a work done by a black person, if you read what the black, what the artist who is black has written about their work, mm -hmm. and you read what the art historian has written, there's a di dissonance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, wait a minute. So what is this art history are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Then I was like, maybe our art history has not been written unless I'm reading someone that is that is black, written by a black person. So this is also I was like, okay, so, and me being interested specifically in body, in, in black people who use their bodies as the first site of interaction and probing and curiosity into making. Now can you say, I'm gonna ask a devil's advocate question. <laughs> um, and I'm asking this question because I'm inviting your help. Mm. Right? Because I get this objection all the time in the work that we do. And I think you're quite right. So whiteness in South Africa doesn't know how to read black art aesthetics. They don't know how to read the blackest. They just can't go Sam. They really genuinely can't. Um, and, and, and there's, a, there's a number of reasons why. I think the fundamental one is a linguistic one. The second is a cultural and historical one. And the third is a political one, right? Um, whereby the world looks like this from our vantage point and anything that is different from that perspective is dismissed, which in itself, I think, demonstrates the provinciality of our white colleagues. Mm -hmm. But what our colleagues will do when you say, as you rightfully say, when I'm reading an artist statement, for example, and it doesn't even have to be an artist statement because if, if we go back to Mo Gerard Sikoto, Mo George Pemba, Mo Dumile Feni, they didn't necessarily have artist statements. Mm. These are people who were just like doing work and putting out work. And maybe sometimes here and there, they'll chat to various people, people about their works. But this is the way it is. When exactly. you read those chats, those conversations, and you're like, wait a minute, but... That's where the art statement is, right? Um, now, the objection that we get, or the objection that I have received, and, 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 I, and I've received it from conservative as well as liberal circles, progressive circles, um, you know, colleagues will say to me, but you're being essentialist when you say to me that white art historians have under-theorized black artists. But they have. <laughs> I know they have. I know they have. Right. So as I say, I'm, I'm asking for your assistance here to say, as a curator, as somebody who's existing in the space of the art world, how do, how do you respond when you say, and, and because I think, in fact, you're actually far more better positioned to do this work than I am. Because as you're curating an exhibition, for example, you will be very intentional to say, I want the space to speak to itself in these ways so that when you experience the space as the viewer coming into this gallery, coming into this exhibition, this is the story that you get, right? Whether you get it at the surface level that I've you know, that I want you to get it at, or whether you get it at the deeply, deeply epistemic and ontological levels that I want you to be moved to when you're experiencing this exhibition. Um, I want you to get the story. Um, you're far better positioned to do that work, for example, than I am, because I'll get the objection, you know, Kumalo, you're inventing categories here. Ayo Kumalo, you're, you know, you, you, you're doing all of these other things. Mm -hmm. So. That, that objection of, of, of essentialism, which I think in, a, in itself is a, is a political move mm -hmm. to silence us about writing about ourselves, mm -hmm. how do we respond to that? One, in the writing of art historians, particularly white ones, they centralize their own voice rather than the voice of the person they are speaking to speaking about mm -hmm. and it's that simple mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is your voice that overshadows what the work is about you centralize yourself in the narrative of speaking about something that you do not mm -hmm. in any shadow of a doubt have any experience in living mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you are not interested or curious enough about the languages in which mm -hmm. the work is coming from the environment mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you are reading it from your position of whiteness that only knows how to center itself. Mm -hmm. So of course <coughs> you will receive an objection because they'll be like, you want to center your voice. Mm -hmm. We don't understand. Mm. Because in an anti-black world, the black person can never be the center. Mm. Mm. But then what is the point, for example, and, and, and the one particular piece that I was obsessed with. But just before mm -hmm. you go, like, because in wanting to, and it's not even rewriting art history, it's not that. Mm. It's, it's about writing. writing. Yes. That initial so step. So in, in this writing, mm. you decentralize whiteness mm. because you are not dependent on the white vocabulary, mm -hmm. on whitest, whiteness's vocabulary to read and write. And this is why then you will be called out on inventing categories mm -hmm. because you are using, you are drawing from a very different place of which they have no access to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why then it feels like, but you are not inventing, you are mm -hmm. remembering. Mm -hmm. You are looking at the image and you are seeing something that is infathomable to a white person that seems impossible. Mm -hmm. You're using a language register and an aesthetic register that they cannot reach for. So decentralizing whiteness as the gaze in which we can look at art at, you mm. know? And, and that, to be able to do that, requires so much unlearning mm. because we are all trained yes. to look through, through the, the white, white gaze. gaze. And this also was my fundamental challenge mm. when I was encountering work because I'd be like, why is this work unsettling? Mm. There's something about this person's work. This is, and I'm like, I could not tap into it because the white gaze can't do that. It can't mm. go, you know? And Where so, this person, it, the artist yes, wants you to go exactly. as and so, a black viewer. And so what does like the white gaze say? Oh, this is a ritual. This is, you know, it's a ritual. And so if we're saying it's a ritual, they, they can be distant, mm. right? Like, oh, the artist like transcended and you know, mm -hmm. so if someone has mm -hmm. transcended, it means that they've detached mm -hmm. from the thing. Mm -hmm. they, they're now floating, and it's okay if you can't access that because, mm -hmm. you know, this. So, you know, decentralizing whiteness becomes a challenge, you know. Mm -hmm. This is why for me, and I, I respect the work of decolonizing, it is mm -hmm. an important work, but for me, mm -hmm. at some point, in the decolonizing project, it becomes violent for black mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. because at the center of decolonizing it's, is colonization. It's colonial. Yes. There's that colonial component. It's that, and mm -hmm. you know, and people have done amazing work and continue mm -hmm. to do. But I think whether we want to admit it or not, mm -hmm. and this is what I experienced, you know, during the Fees Mass Forum, it's like the request for me to die is because colon colonialism. Mm -hmm. You're requesting me to die for revolution because this is the only thing colonialism, knows. slavery, apartheid, you know, systemic violence knows that black bodies die. And I'm like, oh, hell no. I am not, not, not today, not today. I'm not prepared. And I think, you know, there's, there's a lot that you've said there, can you say that, um, that, that, that I'm, 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 I'm kind of thinking and sitting with. Um, and part of it, as again, I, you know, I, I, I want to go back to a piece that I've always been fascinated by from the day that I first saw it on the page. And then on the day that I saw it live, I wept. Mm. I absolutely, I wept. Um, and, and, and this piece has kind of been doing public emergences mm. or public, you know, um, the first time that it did a public appearance was Samuel Mthuli's curation of her inaugural curation at the Standard Bank Art Gallery um, of the Dumile Feni collection. Mm. And this is African Guernica. And I'm fascinated by this precisely because when I'm reading how white people have thought about it, they say, oh, it's ritualistic, oh, it's this, <laughs> or it's that, or it's the other thing. And I'm like, no, it's, it's not. not. <laughs> right? As a second year, I'm reading this thing. And, 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 and one of the people who kind of pushes me to come out with that is, is a good colleague, friend, and teacher, Charlene Khan. You know, I'm like, she's, she shows us these images. We're engaging with these images. Sami Mluli as well is also like, if you are not happy with the description of the image that you're seeing, give me your, your own. own. Yes. 
give me your own, right? Right, uh, right, right? Um, um, and, and, and part of why I get so moved, for example, by African Guernica is because and you don't necessarily, you do see it. Some, some images of that image have been that good, um, whereby you see the two foregrounded figures, mm. three-legged, atop cattle, right? Um, and then you see human f figures receding in the background. And I think Ofeni, the way that I read him there is that he's, he's making a very pointed remark He's saying, and this is in 68, that because he's completed that work, I believe it was either 67 or 68. So you're looking at about two decades, right, of post-apartheid legislation, the entrenchment of all of this stuff. And he's saying, Right? Like the sunset. Mm. Fading, receding into the background. And, 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 and if you think about how many heads of cattle he's got in that image, there are quite a few. Mm. In itself, a statement. Right? Um, of the role and function of cattle as it as it underscores black ontology right exactly absolutely Unmouse. absolutely you know what i mean so so and part of what you then come up against is is this ritualization and it's not ritual it's 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 a question of black ontology there's a piece that's recently come out with a, a, a collection by the HSRC Press, for example. And I'm like, okay, I want to read these pieces in, con in, in conversation. Sure. There's Dumile Feni's African Guernica. There's Mamle Dambulu's Buza. Mm. Um, and, and when you read those two images, or when you, when you read those two artworks in conversation, the music by Mbulu, the, 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 the artwork by Feni, there's a story there that's being stitched because Mamleta says to us, she asks us in a very pointed way, right? Um, and part of it is we can go back to Feni and be like, but that's the thing. That's the thing that we're afraid of because to Another aspect, which mm -hmm. then says, thinking about the fact that this is not ritual. This is a pointed, epistemic, ontological, epionto, what is it? Onto epistemic claim that is being made by these artists, which in itself is so profound, which is why I'm like, but how can we discard our artists and say, I, they are just painting, I, my ulanje, when in fact they are theorizing, deeply theorizing. Deeply about about our experiences. So we've got the diagnosis. And we see this diagnosis of Ingulo in the way that contemporary South Africa is playing itself out today. Mm -hmm. um, as an art historian, as a curator, as a curator, as a practitioner, as a healer, can you say that? Ginombuzo oti. We've got the diagnosis. How do we begin to attend to the challenges that come up for us as we interact, interface, confront this diagnosis? Mm. That's a difficult one. I mean, I think artists, creators, writers, philosophers, musicians, they speak of the illness and also suggest the medicine. Mm -hmm. We need to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is where remembering for me comes in, right? Like, 
if, so what I was saying in the beginning, where did I learn to be afraid of blackness and black? Like when, so which is, when your Babu finished talking about the same thing, you know, Mama, we are both the same thing. We are asking the same question because I'm just like, when, I don't know when I learned it. I don't, I can't pinpoint it. But it was at that, that very moment yes. on that day. Mm. But mm. I know that mm. I, I learned it somewhere, mm. you know. And so I think where you are, you know, you are noticing that there's an illness mm. as a pilang as a mm. Not a lot of people are there. Mm. In mm. order for us to seek and do the work of seeking for the medicine, mm. we have to be in agreement that, first of all, as a right. Because you are not theorizing that we are not okay. This work has already been Be done, done that we're not okay. Mm. But we are not agreeing that we are not okay. This is the first challenge mm. in answering that. Because then if we are in agreement that we are not okay, we begin to look at what creators, be it musicians, be it poets, be it poets, be it writers, yes. be it artists, art practitioners. We look at what they are saying mm. differently mm. because now we are looking to attend to the wound. Mm. But if we do not know that there is a wound to begin with, how will we go to seek for the medicine for something we have no idea to attend to? Yeah. So one of my spiritual mothers who says, Voyo Koyana, used to have Africa, Africa Center in Long Street and run that space that was a business. Said something pro, like, this is, for me, it's still the most profound thing mm. because I go to her in the midst of the student movement and I'm like, I'm so tired mm. of whiteness and its liberalism coming to me and saying, we're going to fix the problem and then they fix a pinky, but the whole body is sick. Mm -hmm. Mm. And she says to me, And I'm also in the, in the midst doing my master's. So I'm like, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm depressed. You know, I'm like feeling all sorts of emotion because what I'm finding out about the history of townships is just like, it's just That's a lot. And Sisvuya says to me, most people buy a lokshini and see the woman who's an alcoholic and think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And want to fix that. And she walks me back. She's like, you are seeing a woman who's an alcoholic in the township who is unable to care for her kids. Trace the wound. Mm. If you trace the wound, you find out she's the first generation of people who were part of the forced removals wound. If you trace the people of the forced removals, you find out that lineage comes from people who had to go and work in the mines and be you know, stay, stay at home, live in help. Mm -hmm. If you check, it's just like, there's a track of woundedness that has never been dealt with. Mm -hmm. That's what I realized in what mm -hmm. you were saying. But, so in wanting to, you know, the township is a production, right? Mm -hmm. It's a rehearsal space of everything that has already happened, this pain, this, mm -hmm. this, this. And so for, for me to want to just work with like, why lo mama a alcoholic? Mm -hmm. I need to actually understand the wound, and the wound is not. And this what mode. produces the alcoholism? Yes. Because what I am no. going to. Yes, and so it's just like, but we need to yeah. be in agreement yeah. of the depth of the wound, and that the wound is not just this this timeline we are dealing with. And it's mas when we go into initiation to be abangoma. The main, one of the main points is that mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that line for me is one of the fundamental things that tells me about the work I need to do on this plane. Which means that the ancestor that I have in their passing, it was either violent and the state, um, situations of duress. Mm -hmm. And so their last memory of being here is one of pain, suffering. Mm. And so, ukwalapa mm. ilose, for me, also means that doing that, 
mm. ancestral mm. spiritual work so that it was on the other side. Mm. Mm. So that it can hold you with softness mm. and tenderness rather than violence mm. that then you reproduce. Mm. And so, but we have to agree with as Pilang. That's the initial move. We have to agree. We have to agree that like the statues and the monuments yeah. plague and haunt the black psyche anywhere you go. Yeah. We have to be agreement. And so what does that mean? So if we have had, if you are a 50 year old black woman, black man living in Cape Town and has only lived in Cape Town, has not traveled anywhere, can you imagine the energy that those statues have been permeating into your life mm -hmm. and the level of violence that you have now normalizes this is just how things are. And this is si life. Agula. And this is life. Yes, si agula. Mm. But mm. we have to agree. On we, that point. Yes, we, th there's a sickness here. And this is where the care comes in, the cure comes in, mm -hmm. right? Like, Uguti as a pilanga. And so, if as a pilanga, we need to attend to how we look and mm -hmm. see differently. Mm -hmm. We need to attend to how we listen differently. Because when we attend to that, we get open to the somatic responses of like, Nali mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. song, the famous song, song, that song. Mm -hmm. And this is and I have not done this to myself. I've been done by the ancestors. Mm. But please, it's a plea, right? Mm. Please, how well. please how well. help me discern this dream state mm. and give me the medicine to mm. heal. You have already shown me in my dream, but I cannot remember. The reason why we sing the songs that like, we cannot fathom what we sing in the dream state. Yeah. We cannot discern it in, into, into this. Yeah timeline to seize out the medicine. This is why we then say, the haulel. Now, can you say, I'm, I'm curious about, as you say, the diagnosis is there. You know, everywhere you turn, um, as early, for example, as Onone Jabav was the Oka people, as early as, you know, um, what is it? As, as, as early as, oh, Diosoka's Uhambulom Hamp, for mm -hmm. example, as, as early as those texts came out, th th there was an observation. I, I, one of the texts that I love, and one of, the, one of my philosophers that I work with, um, is, is, is Ukopa. Now, folks will say to you, Ukopa is not a philosopher. Ukopa was, an, was a poet. And I'll say, ah, sure, maybe he isn't a philosopher. But if you pay attention to the the poetic compositions that he comes up with. And he gives us a number of epics, right? You know, he, he gives us incredibly fascinating insights. Now, go back to for example, which was published in 1888. Mm. And already we have a systematic diagnosis of this is where the problem is. It comes with the institution that is this thing that came with the white people and their education to this land. That is, of course, the southernmost tip of the African continent. How do we, and this is my final concluding question, and, 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 and I pose this question because I don't think mm. both of us have an answer, but I'm thinking about it. I'm sitting with it. Uba, in looking back, for example, Unzikana said it before he dies in 1821. Uh, he says to us, take the things that are agreeable with you and leave those. Yes. yes. So he, his, his position, and he says, welcome them. You know, don't, don't, don't chase them, welcome them, but take the things that are agreeable with you and leave those things that are not agreeable with you. So it's not to say that we don't know what to do. Mm. If we read our history, Umkai himself in Injayelela, which came out, I believe, in, 30, in 1931, he says that our capacity to attend to ourselves, to black healing, to black life, to black aliveness, is the possibility of knowing our history. 
We cannot do that work without that self-knowledge. So, so, so 1821, 1888, 1930, you're tracing, yeah. all of these people are, are, are already giving you the but solutions to, 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 to the problem that is South Africa as a settler colonial society. The challenge, of course, that, I, that I'm confronted by with, and I find myself bashing my head against the wall all the time, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited for having gone to Fort Hare, Jehovah, because at Fort Hare I don't deal with the problems and the challenges of historically white institutions. I deal with another set of problems, but the validity, the legitimacy of black thought at Fort Hare is not questioned. Mm. I do the work that I do. I teach philosophy from a position of blackness, teaching my students that you have the capacity to think, to reason, and to theorize from a position that centers yourself, and that's not questioned. Not by my HOD, not by my colleagues. If anything, my colleagues are like, how can we do more of this work, right? In the spaces where we read, Boma Stellenbosch, Boma Pretoria. Um, and mind you, I've not mentioned the university, I've just mentioned cities. Yes. <laughs> uh, in these institutions where we've read, that kind of work finds an incredible sense of resistance. Um, Marcia Milazzo, for example, you know, in, in her book on Phyllis uh, Ndandala, no, not Phyllis Ndandala, sorry. Um, um, Who's the Don? But she does a beautiful essay, collection of essays in in a in a in a contemporary book, uh, edited by Aretha Peary. Um, and she says, you know, Bigo is not taught, for example, in philosophy courses all across the country. Um, even in no, from school sociology in Stellenbosch, but. <laughs> You don't want to know. Mm. You do um, want to know. He's not taught in philosophy departments across the country. Um, Miriam Klali, that's who she writes about, is not taught in English across mm. the country um, in English departments that are revered as good departments. Mm. How do we break past that to say to our white colleagues, because I think at the end of the day, the sickness that afflicts us is not just a sickness that afflicts blackness and blackness alone. <laughs> it is a sickness that is across the board, across the country. So how do we, or do we even actually, do we even pay attention to the fact that, you know, our white colleagues are not interested in this work? Or do we just say, you know what, if you're not interested, it's fine. We're going to try and do the work that we need to do to attend to blackness. Gepa ignen. Why is she lo umfoganyembezi? What life felt like a cool? Lucia should not so. Um, you know, city life felt like a cool. And and there's a saying that my mother always says. You know, when you're lying, she says, um, "Lo waliko shizingu." Um, and I think you can you can you can translate that now. You can't. You can't. It's gonna sound ridiculous. <laughs> you know. Um, and so I'm I'm. I'm I'm wondering about that to say a city ali weli go shazinguku no ma la feltega kulu do we resign ourselves or do we do the bit that we can with the hope of attending to at least at the very least mm -hmm. the future generations of blackness through the students that we are teaching in our lecture mm -hmm. theaters. Yeah, ne? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the way in which I have been trying to move through that is that I no longer allow whiteness, white people, to disturb me. Mm. Mm. Because what happens is that when we are trying to figure out, so where do we put white people and our white colleagues in this conversation, you know, again, we are having to like carry the burden of whiteness. Like, why are they not doing that work? If they're not interested, mm. then that should not 
to be something that disturbs you if you are interested in blackness, <laughs> period. <laughs> so for me, it's just like, we have been, we can either decide to sustain the disruption that, is, that comes mm. as the aftermath of colonialism and, sla and, and slavery and apartheid mm. by wanting to convince white people to be interested mm. in mm. blackness mm. in the way in which blackness is whole and full mm -hmm. and it is of itself, <coughs> you know? And then that means that we cannot attend to blackness because then the project would be to try and humanize whiteness yes. to understand blackness. Mm. And so for me, what is more important is to humanize ourselves, mm. to sustain the humanity that is us, mm. to be interested and curious about each other's blackness in its specificity, mm -hmm. to be curious about mm. how our blackness exists as a global black diaspora, but also in its specific geographical location. Mm. Mm. To do that work, to attend mm. and tend to Blackness. Our experiences. To yes, mm. to imagine through blackness, to read through blackness, and be comfortable with that because the discomfort, right, mm. is because we've been socialized through a white system. And so sometimes we're unsure. It's just like this work for me mm. is a necessary work. Mm -hmm. It is not a response to or a reaction towards whiteness and white thinking. It is a necessary work for my own Alive net, not survival. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm attending to convincing mm. white system and whiteness and white people, then I am tapping into my survival. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, and I need to repeat this, mm. Mm. being interested and thinking through and living through and conceptualizing and theorizing mm -hmm. and doing work and centralizing blackness and my own blackness mm. in our exist in the world is not a reaction yes it's not a response to it's legitimate in and of itself it is worthy it is just in and of itself mm. for me to be alive mm. Mm. and mm. so for me that's the response to that mm. you know that's how i you know it's like living your life in such a way that you don't need to respond or react to anything anymore your life in itself that's beautiful. I'm going to ask you a last question. Last, last question. <laughs> uh, my last questions are my ningangak. Last question. Who's your favorite artist and why? Oh, that's no, that's not fair. <laughs> no, as a curator, no. Mm -mm. You, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> I won't. I mean, first of all, I'm curating the Liverpool Biennial. It yes. would be... Um, uh, unfair. Un no, not even unfair. Uncaring of me to say uh -huh. this is my favorite artist because uh -huh. I am holding... 36 so artists, many artists. Yes. in that particular yes. show. Yes. I've worked with so many people whose works move me, yes. whose works make me even go deeper into my thoughts, whose works like teach me. Mm. Mm. So. Mm. That's an unfair question. Very it's unfair. An unfair question. Uncaring question, in fact. I, I, I apologize. You know, um, no, don't apologize, but of course there are people whose work I am interested to like, I go back to yeah. their artists that I'm like, I keep on going. I'm just like, mm -hmm. let's let's do this again. Mm -hmm. Come, mm -hmm. let's go play mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. I want to see how you know mm -hmm. and yeah. Mm -hmm. I I you know, there's many artists that that touch me, that that move me. But my favorite artist is my mother. I love that. My love mother that. is my favorite artist in the world. You've just reminded me of something. I I, I was thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. I'm done with my doctoral, and I'm like, who am I going to dedicate it to? And, oh, my and, and, <laughs> and, and like, a revelation. I remember I was going to bed the one night, and I was like, my mother. Yeah. That's, um, the, that's the person yeah. who deserves. My mother is my favorite artist. My mother is a tailor. My mother has uh, dressed me all my life. My mother has, from a young age, designed and made me clothes where other kids were like, Ukogeni, you mm. know, like she made me feel that like it's okay. Mm. You know, my mother still today mm. makes clothes for me. Mm. When I have mm. a big, big event that like she knows I'm feeling, she'll be like, that's Lale Prans, yes. Favorite artist, but mm. also favorite artist because she, you know. She is your mother. She, I am because my yeah. mother dead too. Yes. 
I love that. So my mother is my favorite artist, and my favorite architect is my dad. Uh -huh. My dad uh -huh. was an amazing, an amazing, an amazing human being when it came to like thinking about space mm. and mm. configuring space. Self-taught architect, mm. designing and making <coughs> of a house, like the house that my mom lives in, mm. that was my grandmother's house, now my mother's house, you know, the passing on mm -hmm. of things was designed and built by my father. Beautiful. Favorite architect That's in beautiful. the world. That is beautiful. Because he did to like imagine beyond the a four confines. Room, yes. A four, four room house. Yes. Yes. So the confines yeah. of the apartheid state. Can you say that you are going to Liverpool? Yes. Um, I, yeah. I've been in and of out days. of Liverpool. Yes. Um, I think the, the one thing that I will say as the host of the Black Archive Visual Podcast is I'm excited to see what um, this year's Biennale will give us. I'm excited to see what you are going to do with that space. Um, and I also just want to wish you all the best of luck, you Thank and your you. artists. Thank you. Uh, I want to wish and you the all team. the best. Yes. I work with an incredible team of people. Yes. Um, I, I, I really, I, I, I am hoping to find myself in Liverpool. Uh, Inshallah. <laughs> yes, Inshallah. Yes. Inshallah. I'm and so it shall to, be. I, I'm hoping to find myself in Liverpool, um, specifically, if not for anything else, for the Biennale. Thank you. Um, so thank you for, you know, coming onto this space. Um, being vulnerable enough to share your experiences, your hopes, your dreams, some of the fears maybe even that we hold collectively. Um, I truly do appreciate that and I appreciate your time. Um, Thank I, you. I, I hope that this conversation inspires more conversations in different spaces to think and imagine radically what it means to attend to blackness and the ways in which we curate the world. So on that note, please join us again for the next episode where we will continue to think about um, black music, black art, black poetry, black literature, um, and black life uh, on the Black Archive Visual Podcast. My name is Susebo Kumalo, your host. Thank you for joining us.